Turn to the book of Acts, if you would, chapter 1, and uh, I'm kind of looking forward to this study. I like uh, history, I really do, and uh, Acts, the book of Acts, gives us the history of the beginning, uh, the beginning years of the church, Uh, and we're talking from uh, before the day of Pentecost. Uh, through the life of Paul. Paul basically, um, as of the end of the book, after the end of the book of Acts, uh, Paul is, is uh, executed for his faith. Uh, we, we know and believe that the last letter that Paul wrote or had written was uh, 2 Timothy. And uh, that's where Paul basically said, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. And... Um, so anyway, that it takes us through those early years. It's literally called the Acts of the Apostles. And that's important to keep in mind. Uh, there are things, and I want you to hear this, because somebody's going to try to mess you up. There are things that God, or that Christ, specifically gave to the Apostles only. They had a different place and a different office then uh, you have the what they call the fivefold ministries given to us in First Corinthians, I think it's chapter twelve, and um, you have the apostles, you have the the, the prophets. You ha- I can't remember all of them, but anyway, um, there are things that Jesus specifically gave to the apostles that um, are not. In, in my opinion, are not for everybody. Everybody has a place in the body of Christ. They have a gift that the Holy Spirit will give them. And keep in mind that it is a gift. You don't, you don't earn it. You don't do things to get it. You don't have to show your worth to God or God won't give it to you. Um, it is a gift. If God wants you to have it, boom. Boom. You got it, okay? That, and it's just like salvation. Salvation is a gift. We do not earn salvation. We do not work for salvation. We do not show God that we are worthy of salvation. He has selected us from before the foundation of the, of the earth, the Bible says, and we have been given this awesome... Somebody knock on the door. Anyway... We've been given this incredible gift of salvation and God's love and uh, the gifts that he gives and the callings and the offices that he gives are the selection of God and God alone. Uh, no, no group of lace wearing cardinals choose the next apostle uh, of Rome. Nobody that that doesn't happen. That's not in the Bible. There is no pope in the Bible anywhere. Period. The end. Amen to that. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 1. Let's read. uh, We're going to read down to uh, probably verse 5 tonight. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. That's partially where I get what I just said. He... Gave commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion. His passion is what he did on the cross and his resurrection by many infallible proofs. Being seen of them 40 days. We talked about that last Wednesday, the significance of the 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And um, Theophilus was a man that um, uh, apparently just a, a man of maybe of substance, maybe a wealthy man, but he was a man uh, that heard about Jesus, may have uh, seen Jesus at some point, and uh, he petitioned Luke to first write him a gospel account of the life of Jesus Christ, beginning from his birth, carrying on through his resurrection. And now uh, he is asking Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, to uh, give him a a history of the the early days of the church and uh, the workings and the acts of the apostles. 
So, and let's see, that's old stuff there. Verse 3. No, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, meaning Christ is there with the apostles, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait uh, for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. We're going to deal with that tonight. What was the promise of the Father? You, I'm going to ask you that question after we pray. What was the promise that he was talking about? Which ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings uh, on uh, this, uh, this teaching tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, Jesus and the gift of salvation. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Father, if we were to even try to merit what the Holy Ghost has done in our lives, what Jesus has done in our lives and for us uh, in eternal life, Lord, we would all fall way short of the goal. We've missed the mark already and will never, ever be worthy of the gifts that you have blessed us with. So, Father, we ask you tonight, Lord, to just shower us with your love, your mercy, your gifts. And, Lord, just open up our eyes and our minds uh, to what the Scripture saith concerning uh, the work of Jesus the resurrection of Jesus, the doctrines of Jesus, the kingdom of God, the working of the Holy Ghost seen in the book of Acts and, and other places. And Father, we just ask God that you open our minds to the truth. Let us not go astray after every wind of doctrine. Teach us, God, to test the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. Teach us, Father, to... Cling to your word, anchor our lives to it uh, while we sojourn here on this earth. Lord, just bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Now, uh, the question was, what was the promise of the Father? What was he talking about here? Oh, this is going to be an easy one. Very simple. Who can answer the simple question? Clayton, you got your hand up. Well, that's one of them, but it's not the one that he's referring to in this passage. <clears throat> there you go. I didn't give you a second chance but since you took it anyway. That's all right. all right. That's all right. Life is full of second chances, isn't it? It's the Holy Ghost because he says it here for John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, and I have a theory about verse 5. I'll, I'll explain it more when we get to it, maybe tonight. But to me, there's something missing out of verse 5. And I'm not saying there's a mistake in the Bible. Um, John did baptize with water. And that, what Jesus is quoting here, was what was written uh, in, I can't remember what, there's two Gospels. One of them was John. I think the other one might have been Mark or Luke. But anyway, uh, John truly baptized with water. Um, but John said that there was somebody who was going to follow him who was going to baptize you with something different. And I'm not going to say what it is. I want you to find it, Okay. But I think that it is intentional that that what John the Baptist said uh, in those two Gospels, um, only part of it is listed here in verse 5. I've just opened your brain up to a big mystery box and uh, we'll find out what that is shortly. But let's look at what the promise of the Father, he said, what he, and he specifically referenced saith he, you have heard of me. So let's look at what particularly Jesus referred. He didn't just say what the whole scripture says about the Holy Ghost and being given the Holy Ghost. He specifically mentioned what you have heard of me 
concerning the Holy Ghost. And what most of what Jesus had to say about the Holy Ghost is recorded in the Gospel of John. Uh, so we go to, as soon as I get to it, John chapter 14, turn there. John 14. John, do you remember when you were 14? Was it anything like when you were 15? No. Nope. Yeah. Those days were just a blur for me. I'm going to make a promise to you. If I find it, if I find it, I have an 8 by 10 picture of me from junior high school of my school photo from the ninth grade it's bad it's bad okay if i find it i promise i'll show you uh last i looked i i know i think i know where to look but oh and i was trying to get a girlfriend in those days <laughs> It was bad. That was a horrible weekend for me. Anyway, John chapter 14, verse 15. Let's start there. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. How, and that's it right there. In the Old Testament, they were ordered to keep the commandments. Um, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Remember the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and mother and so on. They were ordered to keep those commandments. And God told them throughout that, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. When people asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, that's what he quoted for them, was that, that passage in, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, love the Lord your God. Because, and, and Jesus, uh, I preached on this here the other uh, couple Sundays ago. When you love God, doing what God said is not a problem. Being obedient to Him, being submissive to Him, submitting yourself to Him even when you do wrong, it is not, a, it's not an issue for you, it's not a problem. It is because you love God. Because you love Jesus, because you love the Holy Ghost and the work of the Holy Ghost in you and, and Christ, what Christ did for you, what he's doing for you right now and the love that the Father has for you when you add all that up, you will love God and then when God says don't do these things, I mean, um, we, when we ran a Christian school here, we were using the Accelerated Christian Education Program. And the more I learned about it, the more I liked. And the more we uh, instituted it, uh, the more I learned from it. Because we had two groups of students here in our school. And I called them Old Testament and New Testament students. The Old Testament students were the ones that they, had, they were under every single rule that I had. They had to be watched. They didn't, get, they didn't get a lot of free time. They didn't get a lot of freedom at all. And we, we actually invented a, a rule that ACE doesn't have called red status. And that was basically if you broke so many rules in a day, the next day when you come in, you were confined to your desk for the day. And people didn't like that. Duh. But it has to be. It has to be that way. You have to understand that when you do things that are wrong, there are repercussions. Always be sure your sin will find you out, God said. And so we had the Old Testament stu uh, students that they had, I had to watch over them. I had to check on them. I had to look at their work. Uh, I had to keep my eye on them throughout the day. Uh, because some of them, they were just rebellious, rebellious, rebellious. Then we had New Testament students. The New Testament students didn't have to be told twice 
what the rules were, what to do. They would come in during the day, in the morning, they would fill out their goal card, they would tack that up there, and they would immediately start working on their goals. You knew that they weren't going to cheat uh, on scoring. You knew that they weren't going to try to get by with something. You knew that they weren't going to cheat when it came to the test. You didn't have to go back and look through their pace to see all the errors that they made because they made themselves of a reputation that they were going to do the right thing no matter what. And those students, we gave lots of free time to. They got extra free time for recess. They got to just go places that we didn't, we didn't feel like we had to watch over them and keep our eye on them at all times. We just, they, they were good students. And, um, e and even to the point to where uh, JR took advantage of this, Callie took advantage of this, they graduated ahead of time. Why? How did they do that? They worked ahead voluntarily. Nobody made them do it. They did it on their own because they wanted to do what was right. And that's two types of people. I would say two types of people that come to church. There is one that God has to make them do everything that he said. And it's because they don't love God like they should. And they don't love other people like they should. So they're going to break God's commandments. But then you have people that have the Holy Spirit in them and they love God and they love people and they, they strive daily to do what's right. Do they make mistakes? Yes. And God doesn't have a problem giving them mercy because he knows that they themselves are merciful. If you love me, keep my commandments. And that's why he said that. And I will pray the fathers. Now we have Christ as the mediator. When we pray, you, when you hear me pray or hear somebody pray, they will say, in Jesus' name. Why do we do that? Because nobody, not me, not you, nobody has the right to go before God the Father because we are sinners. We, we do not have, um, I don't know what to call it. We do not have that access to the Father. Um, there are people and there are churches that when they pray, they'll say a prayer and they'll just say, amen. I'm sorry. They don't cut it. There must be a mediator. Because there was enmity between us and God, wasn't there? And, and a mediator worked out everything for us. And so when we go to God, we must go through the mediator. And there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. That's a direct quote from scriptures. So Jesus says that here, verse 16, I will pray the father. And he shall give, so, and, and Jesus explains this of himself when he asks the Father for something. He says, I'm the Son. My Father loves me, and if I ask him for something that's within his will, will he withhold it from me? And he says, uh, you men out there, you have, you have sons, and if your child asks you for, uh, for bread, would you give him a scorpion? You give them a snake? No. And he said, if you, being evil, will give good gifts to your children, even when they're not deserved, how much more your heavenly Father will give you good gifts? And so, and Jesus is the Son. Jesus tells us, he said, when I pray, my Father gives me what I ask for. And that's why he said, and I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter, capital C. So it's what? A blanket? It's the Holy Ghost. Okay? That's one of the names of the Holy Ghost. That he may abide. Now, let me, let me go back here for a second. Let me, I'm going to ask you a, a question. Which word makes more sense to you? Calling him the comforter? Or calling him the paraclete. I didn't say parakeet. I said paraclete. The Greek word is parakletos. Something like that. But a lot of the modern scholars and high strung preachers. They like to use words. 
that nobody knows the meaning of. It makes them look smart. So they say, the, the, I will give, he, God will give us the paraclete. Who uses that word? It's like telling people, listen, if you don't trust Jesus as your Savior, you're going to Gehenna. Huh? It is. The comforter is, is, what, is what that means, literally. And so the comforter makes it, we understand what that is. And God designed us that even if we, uh, I used to in my younger days when I would go deer hunting, I would rough it. I'd set up a tent, sleep in that thing, freeze to death. But I enjoyed it. Okay? But that doesn't mean I wanted to live in the tent. After so long, you want your comfort. I want my bed. I want my chair. I want my food. Okay? And so God designed us in our bodies, our weak bodies, to need comfort. So how can we live without the comforter? I will, send, I will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have to leave or the comforter won't come. He, he says in verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So that's a promise right there of the day when the Holy Ghost would dwell inside of all of those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus. So he's called the comforter here. He's called the spirit of truth. And uh, John chapter 14. And then down in verse 26, he says it again. And he makes no, uh, make sure we, we don't misunderstand who the comforter is. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So one of the promises that we have uh, from John 14 is that number one, God's spirit will dwell within us. God's spirit will give us comfort when we are stressed, fatigued, um, in pain, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain or spiritual pain, we have the Holy Ghost of God, just like oh, I, I mentioned a blanket. Blankets are comfort. We wrap ourselves up in them. Uh, I do on days when my body aches because of the weather. Uh, I start covering myself up and that feels good to my body i need that um, and the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things so when you read the bible there is a promise from god that as you're reading it the holy ghost is there and he will draw your attention to certain verses certain passages um, and then the Holy Ghost will do, uh, like in Isaiah 28, uh, here a little and there a little, um, precept upon precept, line upon line, that as you're reading something, say in the New Testament, you're reading some of the doctrines of Paul, you're reading Hebrews, and the day before you read Leviticus or you read Numbers, uh, you read something out of the law or something out of the prophets, and all of a sudden, God click something together. I'll never forget the day. Um, I don't remember exactly what day it was, what year it was, but it was early in my studies uh, when God called me into studying the Bible seriously. Was I was reading through, uh, I think it was Isaiah. And in, I, I think it was Isaiah 13. And in Isaiah 13, the Bible says that that the day of the Lord 
is going to be as a woman in travail. And I went, Arr! that's in the New Testament. And I went and found it. It's in 1 Thessalonians 5. And I'm like, could it be that what God is saying here in Isaiah 13 with a, a woman in travail is, is linked with what God said in 1 Thessalonians 5. And so I got my Bible search software out and I looked for travail and I, and I found several key passages in the Old Testament where God spoke of the day of the Lord as a woman in travail. And it was then that it clicked that things in the Old Testament were linked to things in the New Testament um, by, the, by the words, by the phrases, travailing woman. Um, I started looking at stones, rocks. I started looking at water. I started looking at colors, numbers. I mean, I just, once that opened up to me, I couldn't get enough of it. I studied and I studied and I studied and I made notes and I'm like, this is amazing. Doesn't anybody know about this? The world needs to know. Well, a lot of people found out about it long before I did. Um, but that's how the Bible's written. It's intended that God's not going to tell you everything you need to know in one chapter. You need to know what the Bible says. Study to show thyself approved unto God. And so the Holy Ghost will teach you those things. He'll bring them to remember. Sometimes he'll do it when you're not even reading the Bible. All of a sudden, verses come in your head and the Holy Ghost links them together and you just go, whoa. And I would do that and my wife would go, what's the matter with you? She thought I was having a conniption or something. It scared her at first. And then she's like, oh, he's doing that. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Look at that. That's what I just said. Whatsoever I have said unto you. So, if you have a problem memorizing the Bible, and some people do, just keep reading it. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. The Holy Ghost will bring verses to your mind that you read at one time, and you're going like, how in the world did I remember that? I've preached messages where verses came to mind and I'm like, that was really good, Mike. Wow. Uh, but it wasn't me. It was, it was God. That was the Holy Ghost doing that because the Holy Ghost was ringing somebody's bell or, or whatever. Holy Ghost wanted people to hear that and he made me say it. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Turn to John 15. John 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even, now he says it again, even the Spirit of truth. So, think about it for a minute. If the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of truth, and the Holy Ghost brings Bible verses to our attention, can those Bible verses be wrong? No. Logically, no. If the Holy Ghost brings a verse to your mind, that verse cannot be wrong. It is not copied wrong. It has not been translated wrong. It must be true in everything that it says. Can you get away, well, some people do, but legally, when you take a witness stand and either affirm or swear an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God, some courts still do that. If you tell a lie on the witness stand, are there repercussions? Perjury. That's jail. Big time. Judges do not like to be lied to. They don't. And they, they take it severely. Okay? Uh, you'll get into a lot of trouble. Well, God is not a man that he should lie. And the Holy Ghost is God. That's what we believe. 
thought the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. These three are one. The Holy Ghost cannot lie, therefore the Word cannot be wrong. Okay, because the Word is the Spirit of Truth. Jesus said it in John 6. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's the Holy Spirit right there. Uh, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Verse 27 now. Now we have the Holy Spirit in us, the Comforter, to help us not only know what the Bible says, but to bear witness of it. That means that somebody you know that you believe has been reading the Bible, studying the Bible, they go to church, you know they pray, and you've got a question about the Bible. If you have a question about the Bible, do you go somewhere like to the bus station down in downtown St. Louis and ask a wino? I don't think that word's been used in a long time. Ask a drug addict drunk hanging out downtown, do you ask them about what the Bible says? No. Do you ask a college professor who's an atheist about what the Bible says? No, he's going to tell you, you don't read that. Um, you ask somebody who you think should know the Bible. Um, I wish people that watch us online or maybe sometimes that come here um, before they say, did you know the earth is flat? That they would first come to me and say, you know, I'm seeing some things online that the earth is flat and I, I don't know I want to believe what's true. Pastor, can you help me with that? I'd love to. I'd love to. Because I can show you from scriptures that it is impossible. Impossible. Scripture cannot be broken, which means scripture cannot be wrong in anything it says. And, uh, but when it comes to stuff like that or uh, Mandela effect or whatever, they don't, usually don't ask me. I've had some people ask me, and when they ask me, I usually end up doing it on Pastor Mike Online. I deal with the subject. Um, a guy called a couple of weeks ago and asked me a question, and I dealt with it the next day. Well, it was, it was about um, the three days that Jesus was in the heart of the earth. So anyway, verse 27, Ye shall also bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Well... The way that we have been with Christ from the beginning is by reading Matthew. Matthew deals with the birth of Christ. Luke deals with the birth of Christ. Mark and John deal with, they pick up the story of Christ at his baptism uh, by John the Baptist. And um, so that's how we can be with Christ from the beginning. Um, and the Holy Ghost will help us bear witness. You may say, well, I have, a, you know, I have a learning thing and I don't memorize scripture well and I just don't feel, I can't really just go up to people and talk to them. Believe it or not, I have a problem with that. Uh, I am a lot more shy than you would think I am. Um, but for me to just walk up to a perfect stranger and start witnessing to him, that is something that I am very deficient in. And um, it probably has something to do with I don't know, being rejected or whatever, or, or killed, you know. But there have been situations where the Holy Ghost opened up the opportunity and the door, and I walked right through it, and it was easy. So God will make things that to you are difficult, He will make them easy. You, can, you will be a witness unto God. John 16, verse 7, turn there. Verse 7. Imagine that. Jesus said he tells the truth. Amazing. Now, I'm not a big fan of C.S. Lewis, but one thing that C.S. Lewis said that I liked, uh, and he was dealing with the issue of whether Jesus was God or not. And he said, if you ask a lot of people, what do you think of Jesus? 
they will more than likely say, well, I believe he was a good man, a good teacher, and, and stop there. And you ask them, do you believe he was God? No, I don't believe he was God. I, I believe he was a good man, though. And so C.S. Lewis, he had a Latin phrase for it, and I don't remember it. But he said the, the phrase was either Jesus was God or he was a bad man. He was evil. Why? Because he lied. He lied. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He claimed divinity throughout his ministry. I and the Father are one. And the Pharisees understood exactly what he said. And that's why they got mad at him. Jesus himself declared his own divinity. So how can a good man deceive people by claiming that he's God when he's not? So you can't have it both ways. You can't say Jesus, I believe Jesus was a good man, but I don't believe he was God. It's a contradiction. Okay, so that's as far as I go with C.S. Lewis. All right, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Now think about it, what he's saying here. Uh, and, and what I preach Sunday. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Was what Hebrews said. So Christ is one man on the earth. Speaking to a limited number of people. I mean he preached in Jerusalem. He went all the way up into Syria. He went to Galilee, different places. He's preaching the gospel. But Jesus is limited because he's a human. And he can't be everywhere while he's here on the earth in that form. He can't, he can't preach to the entire world. So it, he says, it is expedient for you that I go away. Because if, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And then the Holy Ghost is a spirit. And is a spirit, especially God's spirit, is God's spirit limited as to who he can speak to at one time? No. One of the doctrines that we hold about the Holy Spirit is the same thing we say about God the Father and Christ now in that they are omnipresent, meaning that they are everywhere all at once. Uh, some people like to change that and say God is anywhere at any given time. No, that still limits him. God is everywhere all at once. There is no place that God is not. When you're big enough to hold the heaven in your hand, you can be everywhere. Amen? Okay, so that's what he means by that. Christ in his human body, limited to only preaching who's there with him at that time. So he has to leave. God sends the Holy Ghost who can be all around the world. God can, the Holy Ghost even extends beyond the earth. Uh, what religious thing did the astronauts of Apollo 8 do when they made their first trip around the moon and saw the earth? It was Christmas, by the way. What religious thing did those three astronauts, Jim Lovell and I can't remember who else was with him, what did they do? Does anybody know? No? Um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin did communion. They were broadcasting as they came around the moon and they said, we have a message for all the people on planet Earth uh, at this Christmas time. Yes! What'd they do? No, well, but you got to be specific. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness. And they, they read all of Genesis 1 from King James Bible. The Holy Ghost went around the moon, as far as I'm concerned. Amen?
Okay? I, I still get doodads over that. I just, that was at a time when America tolerated Christianity. And Madeleine Murray O'Hare sued NASA over that. Stupid. She's in hell right now, by the way. Uh, verse 8, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. In other words, one of the jobs of the Holy Ghost is to convince you that you are a sinner in the hands of an angry God. Reprove the world of sin and of righteousness. The job of the Holy Ghost is to lead us into righteousness and to teach us what is right. And of judgment. The Holy Ghost in us gives us discernment so that we look at something and we say, oh, that don't look right. Just the same way you open up the refrigerator, you pull something out, you take the lid off and go, I don't think I'm going to eat that. That's discernment, right? Okay, same kind of discernment. You're able to determine in this world what is rotten and what is ripe. That's judgment. God gives you good judgment. So you know what's right, know what's wrong. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judge. You'll be a whole lot better equipped at spotting the devil, who's very snaky. Amen? I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So how is he going to get it to us? Through the word and through the Holy Ghost. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come. It's the third time he calls him that. Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into how much? All truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. And I would say that any church that emphasizes the Holy Ghost, or what they say is the Holy Ghost, more than they emphasize Christ, they've got it wrong. They've got it wrong. The Holy Spirit does not draw attention to himself. He, he draws attention to Christ. Um, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now think about, think about what that means. In Revelation 5, God has the book in his right hand, sealed with seven seals. The only one worthy to take it is Christ. The only one worthy to loose the seals is Christ. And so Christ begins opening the first seal, second seal, third seal, fourth seal. We still don't have an eclipse. Fifth seal, sixth seal. We still don't have eclipse. Seventh seal, he opens up and now the book is unsealed and Christ then will guide us into that truth. He will guide you in truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. Uh, that, okay, what I meant to draw your attention to was for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So when Christ receives the book, he opens it up. The Holy Ghost then can share with us what has been unsealed in the Word of God. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he, the Holy Ghost, shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Um, boy, you know what? I opened up almost right to that exact place that I was going to go to. One verse. And I'm going to, we're going to have prayer. My, my verse, Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and shew unto thee, show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And so I began uh, one day back in 1997, uh, bowed before God. And I said, God, show me. And I didn't know what to ask for. And God began to show me things. And then I began to ask questions. God, show me this. God, will you show me that? Uh, some things that I've asked for, God has shown me. Some things that I've asked for, God has not yet shown me. Will he? I'll leave that up to God. Um, 
but I, I want it so that whatever comes out of me, I want to be convinced in my own heart and matching it up with scriptures, I want to be convinced that it came from God. I don't want to try to tell you some thing about the eclipse and how God is talking to us through the eclipse and how it's going to be a big thing. And then when, when it doesn't happen, go on to something else and tell another lie. And the people who believe that stuff, and when it all turns out to be a lie, they got what they got coming. Because they're going to believe more lies. Because that, apparently that's what they want. If that doesn't, if when somebody lies to you like that, and you find it out, if that doesn't cause you to just say, you know what, I'm not going to have no more. And I'm, I'm talking about spiritual things. Somebody just blatantly lies to you. I could be wrong, but if somebody blatantly lies to you and you keep going back for more, then you're the, you're the dog that licks up the vomit on the table. Amen.